today uh, we have uh, Mr. Keith Royer, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, an early American economist, uh, Davenport, and his uh, Herbert Davenport and his political economy. Uh, Keith is a PhD student in economics here at Auburn University. Um, he's a Mises Fellow, of course, and um, he teaches uh, economics in uh, at Auburn. And as a matter of fact, Keith won the Graduate Teaching Award this year in the department, which is uh, which is always a great thing. I always like to see the Austrians racking up those kinds of uh, awards. So congratulations, Keith, and uh, let's hear your stuff. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, let me start off with, <clears throat> I've been to a number of the uh, brown bags this year, and they uh, all ha seem to have their own flavor. Uh, I will emphasize the informality of the brown bag seminar. Uh, also em emphasize the seminar part of the seminar. Uh, so speak up if you have questions or if you want to uh, add something. Uh, I'll take a very informal approach to this. Uh, this assignment was was originally given to me uh, back in the uh, early part of this year uh, to decide whether Herbert Davenport Davenport was a uh, an American Austrian a scholar of the early part of the century. My method of research on on deciding this, and I will uh, maybe let everyone make up their own mind given what I uh, I have to present here today, uh, not be decisive myself. But uh, my method of research has not been to go back and read over all of his works um, because of time limitations for one I've, I've gone to the other scholars I've gone to uh, Mark Blog uh, uh, professors Eklund, Eklund and Hebert their text uh, a guy named Haney Whitaker some other history of thought type people to see what they have to say where they put him Schumpeter especially uh, where how they would characterize Herbert Davenport so that's been my method uh, if there are any true Davenport scholars here that probably wouldn't be uh, uh, to your liking, but uh, as I say, he wrote four major books, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So, uh, As an introduction, Herbert Davenport was born in, in Wilming Wilmington, Vermont in 1861. Uh, he passed away in uh, 1931. Okay. He received his uh, Ph.D. in economics from the University of Chicago in 1898. Um, he, studied, uh, he studied in Paris. He studied at South Dakota and um, one other place. I can't remember where, and I don't seem to have it written down here. But um, he studied abroad, and he studied here. Uh, he taught at the University of Chicago from 1902 to 1908. From there, he was the dean of one of the schools at the, the University of Missouri from 1908 to 16, 1916. And from there, he uh, spent the latter part of his life from 1916 to 1929 as a professor of economics at Cornell. In 1920, Herbert Davenport uh, was the president of the American Economic Association. And I will uh, also emphasize the political, as I think I said, maybe the political economy part of this uh, seminar. And I will quote a good deal from this AEA address uh, that he gave in 1920. <clears throat> it's quite telling, possibly. Uh, it's offered by uh, people like James Buchanan that uh, Davenport's relative obscurity, and indeed it is, uh, he is rather obscure, even in the history of thought texts that I found out, uh, Professors Eklund and Hebert do not, do not have a site to Davenport in their text. Uh, Schumpeter, in his History of Economic Analysis, has, has four sites in the index. He has four page references, but those are small, you know, just a mentioning of a name. They don't go into any extensive detail as to his, uh, his thought, though Schumpeter said if he had more time and space, he, he would gladly do that. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. I, I'm not sure. Uh, we've got a thousand-page book. so. Uh, <laughs> and percentage-wise, uh, James Buchanan uh, has a, uh, if you take percentages, a more favorable uh, disposition on, on Davenport, possibly, that he, co he commits two pages of a hundred-page text uh, to Davenport. So... Uh, percentage basis, he he wins out there. Um, what was what was the book that uh, cost and calculation? Cost and calculation. Yeah, uh, which I'll speak of here in a moment. Uh, Buchanan comments that Davenport was relatively obscure uh, and had a small following of students in his day, mainly because he he failed to articulate his ideas well, um, and he had a, a, a pestilence toward the idols of the profession of the day. Uh, he liked to badmouth people, evidently, uh, especially Marshall, 
uh, although some people lump him in together with uh, Marshallian analysis. But uh, as, as I continue, we'll, we'll see some of this maybe bad-mouthing come about. Uh, over his career, he did author four books, uh, Outlines of Economic Theory in 1896, Value and Distribution, which seemed to be the, maybe the capstone of his work. Uh, some say that there's a, it's, it's difficult mining, but once you get there, it's, it's uh, rather rich. Uh, that particular book, and Economics of Enterprise in 1913, and uh, the Economics of Alfred Marshall, published posthumously uh, in 1935. Um, Mark Blog comments that uh, Davenport was a pupil and admirer of uh, Veblen, uh, although Davenport, uh, Blog comments, although Davenport did not study uh, institutions as Ve Veblen did. Uh, Davenport felt or saw economics as, as uh, all being relative. And that will come out uh, in his AEA address also, that uh, we're just looking at relative changes. We're not looking at institutional structure necessarily. Uh, further, Davenport sought an economic theory based on prices and excluding the psychological elements of Marshall and the Austrians. Yeah, so he, uh, he, he was pretty explicit in some of his... Uh, like I say, he was kind of nasty at times, evidently, uh, according to uh, Frank Vetter and others. But uh, he uh, was rather explicit, and he called into question a lot of the Austrian doctrine of the time, uh, which may be important, um, and that he was maybe commenting on, on Menger and some of the early Austrians, which uh, maybe today's Austrians, even Mises and Rothbard, would probably say, no, he's right. They were wrong in that aspect, if, if that's understandable. Uh, so to the subjectivism, he, he, he did have a subjectivism. Let me go on to this. Uh, subjectivism without the psychology. He wanted to get rid of these psychological elements. At the turn of the centuries, uh, writers such as Casal and, or Castle and uh, Valral were attempting to limit the field of uh, study of economics to something that's solvable by a system of equations. Uh, a separate branch or a competing branch of theory at the time was... Uh, uh, divergent to this and wanted to avoid ethical and philosophical complications uh, to see, well, hold on, to get rid of difference between costs and wants. There were two competing branches at this time. One was this mathematical track that uh, people got on. The other one was a non-mathematical, more verbal explanation. Uh, Davenport was in the more verbal, uh, on the more verbal rail, and he seeked to get rid of though the ethical and philosophical, philosophical complications uh, and not to let those mess up his work or get into his work. Um, his his uh, attempt in his economics was to reduce costs to the subjective opportunities foregone by entrepreneurs. <coughs> that sounds r rather Austrian. Uh, we've got subjective opportunities there, uh, and we've got the entrepreneur. And in, in fact, Buchanan claims that uh, Davenport's emphasis on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial cost uh, stemmed from his criticism of other writers at the time, once again, criticism, uh, especially or notably of Marshall. And Davenport writes that Marshall's analysis of the relationship between rent and cost is so unsatisfactory due to the fact that he is, has not appreciated that cost as bearing upon supply is, a collect, is not a collectivist phenomenon, but is strictly an entrepreneurial uh, competition and as such is exclusively within the sphere of the of the individual psychology. Not, not a page before, at the top of this page, I'm talking that he wants to get rid of psychology, the psychological elements out of economics, and, you know, halfway down the page, he's trying to put them back in. It's kind of unfortunate. In, in reading through um, what other historians had to say about Davenport, and you go back and look at some of these references, it's rather foggy, it's rather murky. He seems to jump around quite a bit. And this will come out at the end also. Uh, I think it, it kind of shows all the way through this, this discussion I'll have. Um, so Buchanan claims embedded in Davenport's value and distribution in his book Value and Distribution is a concept of opportunity cost uh, almost as sophisticated as succeeds. And he puts uh, Davenport in his cost and calculation, Buchanan's cost and calculation, he places Davenport between uh, Vixeed and uh, Knight. In, in development of theory. So that kind of gives a historical perspective there. Um, although Davenport had the idea of subjective opportunity cost uh, in common with the Austrians, he rejected, and this is the way it's put, and this is, 
the way I kind of caution that it may be looking at the older Austrians uh, and not necessarily the a reformed Austrian school or however you want it, the Messician school or whatever, uh, is that uh, he rejected the hedonism uh, of the Austrian school of the day uh, and their idea that marginal, marginal utility was causal. Uh, so... So he rejects, uh, and we, we've talked about this in the office earlier, he rejects the idea that uh, uh, marginal utility causes action. Um, I think that would be counter to what Austrians would say at the day or e even today, is that that marginal utility uh, doesn't cause one to value a good. It's maybe iffy. I'm not... I think he uh, he disagrees with this this marginal utility analysis uh, that uh, marginal utility was was the causing factor in, in acting. So you have to keep that in mind. Maybe that's a point. Um, according to Haney, uh, who a, writes a history of thought book, uh, this idea this this denying the marginal utility as being causal and whatnot this equates Davenport more closely. With, with mathematical price economists of the time. So we get a very, it's, it becomes very murky. Uh, Haney puts him in more with Marshallians, but he denies himself to be, and he actually criticizes Marshall. Uh, so you get very divergent views as to where this man actually stands in the, in the, uh, the spectrum here. Uh, Davenport's training was as a classical economist, uh, though he was not at, at the time nor today would be considered a mathematical economist. Um, Davenport rejects this idea of hedonism, uh, of the calculation of pleasure and pain, uh, of the Austrian schools and, Je and Jevons. They, these writers at the time tend to put Jevons uh, in with the Austrians, in with the subjective, uh, the subjectivism, uh, and Jevons' drawing of a marginal, if we can imagine the demand curve sloping downward, that this is a marginal utility curve, and as you consume more along this axis, then your marginal benefit. Uh, decreases, diminishes, and so this this is the idea from I guess Dupuy and Jevons that uh, we have this, and so uh, uh, Davenport rejects this this particular idea, and he says that the these curves are more once again Marshallian in 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 derivation that they come strictly from the market that we draw call it, we draw supply and demand curves strictly given prices on the market. Um, strange to figure out. Strange to figure out. Um, Davenport's theory does adopt the entrepreneur's point of view uh, and related opportunity costs, subjective opportunity costs that I've already alluded to. Uh, but he he assumes that prices are given, and uh, he assumes prices to be given, and uh, makes utilities and disutilities depend on the prices instead of marginal utility depending or being the causal factor on prices, it's prices that determine our, our utility. I think, he's ba I think it's backwards from, from what Austrians would, uh, would espouse. And, and in fact, I mean, he says it is. Um, uh, this, this dependence, he, called, uh, or he comments, works through uh, voluntaristic acquisitive opportunities uh, which present themselves in markets. Now, this point sounds very much like a Krasnerian uh, the entrepreneur as not as a, a seeker of opportunity, but the entrepreneur, I think, is, as Joseph Lerner has said, of you know the guy walking down the street saying the dollar bill lay on the floor or lay on the street, that he, he just sees it from the market and he grabs it from the market, not someone who, uh, what we would think of as an entrepreneur, going and, and trying to find profitable opportunities. He waits for the market to indicate them to him. Once again, maybe, maybe somewhat uh, backwards from what we would... Uh, we would associate with Austrian theory. Um, as commented earlier, Davenport wanted to rid economic theory of psychological factors of explanation. To this end, he commented that the interest rate, uh, and this is, once again, he uh, gets a little confused, uh, the interest rate is determined by the supply and demand in the market. Okay, No doubt psychological factors lie behind why people lend and borrow. But this is, not for this, but this is for the psychologist to study. These psychological factors are not within the province of the study of economics. So he's wanting to keep these, once again, keep, keep these psychological factors out. He admits that they're there. We're just not going to study them as economists. 
Another historian, Whitaker, points out that both Castle and Davenport uh, were associated with this movement to rid economics of, of uh, these psychological factors, but they both from time to time let, let these factors slip into their analysis. Uh, this following passage from Davenport's Economic Enterprise is a good example. Uh, for, each individual, for each individual, consumption stops and saving begins uh, where the advantages from saving, whatever these may be, make an appeal strong enough to displace present consumption. So we've got the psychological factors there. He's talking, he's talking about the psychological factors, but he wants to rid economics of it. It's difficult to do this. And I think with the work of other people at Chicago today and, and Mises himself, uh, when he was writing in Rothbard, it, these things have to be taken into consideration. Uh, I mentioned Chicago today, Becker and, and these guys who, who write along those lines. Um, so let's, I'll move on here to uh, Davenport on Wealth is the next subtitle I've got here. Um, when the subjective uh, turn to wealth, or when the subjective theorizing turned to wealth, uh, and what was to be considered as wealth, Davenport was fairly modern in his thinking uh, on this particular point. Davenport declared, using the subjective idea, Davenport declared that, what, uh, that it was not the economist's place to enter into ethical judgments, and therefore the economists could not say uh, what did or did not constitute wealth. All right. Uh, from the Economics of Enterprise, uh, he, he comments, and I need help. I cannot find this in a dictionary. Does anyone know what Peruna is? P-E-R-U-N-A. It's evidently a drug of some sort from, from something it's I read. It's a patent medicine. It's, it's a patent medicine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he mentions this and in another passage I'll read just in a moment. Mm -hmm. Fetter mentions it. I can't find it in a dictionary anywhere. Anyway, uh, this is from the Economics of Enterprise. Peruna, hop uh, bitters, obscene literature, indecent paintings, picture hats, and corsets are wealth, irrespective of any ethical or conventional test to which they may or may not conform. Being marketable, price-bearing, they are wealth. What is the economist that he should go behind the market fact and set up a social philosophy of ultimate appraisals. Um, to the above definition of wealth, Frank Fetter, in a 1914 JPE article reviewing the economics of enterprise, uh, he must have been replying to this. Fetter was replying to this, uh, this particular topic, uh, or this particular um, uh, piece, when he comments uh, somewhat disapprovingly that uh, Peruna as an example of, uh, of harmful yet valued pro products is administered in large doses. And burglars with their jimmies and loose women with their flaunty appeals appear so often that they make some chapters of this book appear like an evening at the uncensored movies. So uh, <laughs> they, uh, if nothing else, these guys could write well. Uh, <laughs> so... Better in reviewing the economics of enterprise. That's what he had to say about uh, about uh, Davenport's work here, or at least in part. Uh, Feder goes on to say that uh, indifferent to the larger social spirit which has pervaded economic writings uh, and political economy, Davenport characterizes them as if we were still in the days of Nassau Senior at his worst. He Davenport scouts political economy as a pious aspiration. Busy picturing utopias, lacking all touch with life, a sheer farce. Um, and this, I think some would probably uh, still comment today that uh, uh, Marshall and some of the others were maybe utopian dreamers looking for zero transaction cost world and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, so he may not be completely wrong in that, but uh, he was I guess he had a rather biting uh, pen when he wrote. So uh, Davenport describes contemporary early 20th century economics as a system of apologetics. The creed of the reactionary, a defense of privilege, a social soothing syrup, a smug pronouncement of the righteousness of whatever is, with a still more disastrous corollary of the unrighteousness, unrighteousness of whatever is not. Uh, Fetter comments in his review that such, that such extravagance in rhetoric is expected from self-trained zealots such as Henry George or the persecuted revolutionary Karl Marx, uh, but that e even they uh, do not excel in some part Davenport's uh, language. So we get a, get a taste there for some of his writing, maybe. Uh, the next section that I'll, I'll hit upon here, and I kind of broke this down 
in sections, actually this is the last one, uh, broke it down into different topics that uh, Davenport wrote on. And this is wealth and taxation. And uh, Davenport claims uh, in Economics of Enterprise that two-thirds of durable private uh, base, excuse me, Davenport claims that two-thirds of the durable private basis of income in the U.S. are nothing else than capitalization of privilege or predation. Predation. So he feels that everyone's either privileged of the privileged class or, or predatory. Uh, he continues that five-ninths of the durable wealth reported by the census is made up of privately appropriated social wealth. Uh, Veblen sneaks in here, I think. I think uh, possibly. Uh, these observations, Davenport declare, show the inadequacy of a single tax program. And I'll read extensively maybe here in a moment from that. Uh, this reasoning carries Davenport into what uh, Frank Federer has called radical communism, uh, although in 1913 Davenport uh, claims to have no socialistic uh, sympathies. Let me read now uh, from his AEA address. Uh, this was published in the March 1921, if anyone wants to look that up, uh, AER, uh, lead, lead article. And this was his address, address on December 20th, 1920, to the American Economic Association. I am, that is to say, convincedly, even I, sus even I suspect dogmatically, a Democrat in the sense that I believe thoroughly in pop popular government, in the equality of individuals, in political rights and responsibilities, as also in the high and substantive value of freedom in its own behalf. I do not, however, ascribe to political freedom any essential sanctity or uh, of ultimate or natural or inevitable rightness. Democracy may easily approach to the worst of all forms of government, in danger of being no government at all, but mere license, disorder, revolution, and counter-revolution, in the degree that any people fall short of meeting its severe requirements. A populace incapable of understanding its own needs, but attempting to rule in its own interest, is almost certain to blunder into its own great harm. It might uh, it might better rely on such incidental uh, welfare as may befall from an intelligent and efficient government conducted primarily in another interest. Uh, he continues on, political uh, democracy is doubtless, is doubtless as readily possible in a collective as in a competitive economic order. Perhaps indeed is more easily possible in the sense of making call for less uh, Vigilant intelligence in, in, a, in a more collective uh, environment, we have less uh, need less vigilant intelligence. Uh, but I am not. But I am not a socialist, if for no other uh, or better reason than that I am unable to make out what the socialist ideal. What is the socialist ideal? The family writ large, the brotherhood of man, would would uh, concretely turn out to be or do. He can't figure out what the socialist creed is supposed to, to go to. Uh, I just don't get it. Let me, let me do a couple more and then we can take questions. Uh, but further I hold with the practical, uh, but further I hold with the practical working necessity of competition and of competition within as well as without the economic field. Only that also I seem to myself to know that, that it is not all wholesome. And that some of its unregulated workings are pernicious and extremely dangerous, not merely directly to the general welfare, but to the very perpetuity of competitive institutions. A regulated competition I take to be imperative. Robert Reich, enter. <laughs> if competition is to be and to remain a tolerable system. Successful comp competitive uh, institutions I hold require an intelligent uh, intelligent guidance, which so far they, they have measurably lacked. Um, you know, it's a little iffy here. If he, if he is, as, as I conclude here at the bottom of my paper, I'll read one more and then give you uh, this conclusion. Uh, this is regarding taxes. We're still on taxes and wealth. And this regards uh, taxes. He writes later on, higher inheritance taxes? Question mark. Yes, say I who in order that the competitive system may both endure and deserve to endure would check economic stratis stratification, would hinder the emergence of differentials and handicaps. 
If also the socialist says yes, as directed by, by his opposition to private property in general, we can so far work together instead of at cross purposes. So if we're willing to walk the road with the socialists, that's fine. We, we, can, we can do that. Our differences are not actual. We desire the same particular thing, the thing at hand, only with different ends. I advocate progressive taxation in general in order to mitigate the economic inequality that in my view is putting in hazard the political and economic democracy of the competitive order. If to my socialistic neighbor the same policy appeals as a, as a step toward the abandonment of the competitive order, it is still true that on either basis of policy the thing is good. Uh, I conclude, and I will conclude here and, and take questions. You were doing so good, Jeff. <laughs> I conclude that uh, uh, it may be claimed that Davenport had some ideas in common with, with uh, the early Austrians. The subjective opportunity cost idea was there. It definitely was. Schumpeter, in his History of Economic Analysis, one of the few places in which he quotes and does, uh, kind of put him in that camp <coughs> with the early Austrians because of this idea. Um, However, if we if we do do this, and he kind of had the entrepreneurial idea, although it was I think more Krasnerian than Misesian, uh, Misesian. I don't know if we want to call him a fellow traveler, honestly. Uh, uh, if he is an Austrian, he's definitely not a classical liberal, and we generally associate the you know one with the other. So uh, I know uh, Mr. Rockwell had told me that Murray was going to write uh, had he uh, lived long enough to uh, in his third volume uh, on Davenport. I would like to know. I wish I did know what he had to say. Uh, man, Economy, and State, uh, Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State has one reference uh, to Davenport only, and it's just a reference to a uh, paper that he wrote on costs. Uh, so, I don't know. It would be tough. <coughs> tough to call him an Austrian. I'm not sure. You said he um, went to school at, at Chicago? Yeah. He got his PhD at Chicago, and he taught... Uh, uh, evidently at Missouri, which I think Jeff has discovered that, uh, who was there? Yeah, F.A. Harper apparently was a student. And F.A. Harper was the founder mm. of the Institute of Brigham Young Studies. Yeah. And Professor Cornell. Oh. Mm -hmm. Who was he? Say up. There is not, honestly, there is not a whole lot out there. And from this, I'm not a socialist, but we'll walk together if you want to. Um, when Buchanan writes about him, does he, tell, does he specifically praise his inheritance tax ideas? <laughs> no, no, no. Buchanan strictly talks about his, his cost idea. It's strictly the opportunity, the subjective opportunity cost idea. And that is, I, I think that would be, uh, you know, we'd put that block over here in the Austrian school. That's fine. Um, like I say, though, it, he's not a classical liberal. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Well, you could... You know, called New York University. Those folks are always looking for socialist Austrians <laughs> to demonstrate that Austrian economics is right. These are traditions, right? He does, uh, and I don't have any, I didn't put any of the quotes in here. He does have kind of a biting tongue even toward the Austrians uh, in his day in some of the books. So, what, what about that? Who, who does he reference, and what does he say? Uh, Bombaver he references quite a bit. Wieser also, though. Uh, he never. I've not seen a reference to uh, Menger in any of the books. To Carl Menger. I saw a reference to Anton. I'm not, is, that, yeah. is that his father? Or that was a, his brother. His brother. brother. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I'd heard the name. I couldn't place it. But in there was a reference to Anton, but not to Carl. In his book on cost and distribution, he does reference Carl Menger once on the origin of money or something like that, but mo there's more references to Anton Menger. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about this, this notion of uh, being critical of um, Marshall. I've, I've read parts of his <coughs> book on Marshall, and, uh, and it, it kind of makes sense now because he lumps Marshall in with the classicals. He puts Marshall in with the classicals and accuses him of just sort of being a um, mathematizer of mill mm -hmm. and picking up on Malthus and Mill and, and making all the same mistakes that they made. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting now to know that you get an idea that he wasn't really a classical liberal, right. that he could be critical, that he could be saying that about Marshall and I at the time. Did he teach at Chicago, when you said he taught at Chicago, was that just like right after he graduated, or did he come back? He, he came back, he, he got his degree in uh, 98, and then he taught there from 1902 to 1908, so he was gone for a few years, I'm not, and I don't, uh, I got that 
biographical type information from Mark Bloggs, uh, who's who in economics, and that's all he had uh, was that those years at Chicago and then at Missouri and then at uh, Cornell. But then he was at Cornell, and wasn't Knight? Did Knight graduate from Cornell at about the time mm -hmm. that he would have been teaching? And see, there's the what I was thinking of is in terms of well, the Buchanan connection of Buchanan yeah. to sure. Knight. Sure, sure, yeah. That if if there was a connection between Davenport and uh, and Knight directly, yeah, that could be. Sense of both uh, that Knight might have been a student of of Davenport. Yeah, uh, that that could be. Uh, Buchanan doesn't make any reference to such a uh, scenario, but that that could very well be. He's not knowing much much about this literature. Um, I know that every time I, I dip into any of the American uh, any of the American economists from this period, they all they all seem crazy to me. Yeah. And they're they're um, you know touting central banking and progressive income tax and antitrust law. They're every every horrible thing uh, you can think of. So I you know I wonder I wonder if you have to be sort of forgiving uh, in a sense of Davenport's errors given the given the, the profession of the time and the dominant strains. Uh, and sort of look for the good part of Davenport and, and ask whether or not uh, he was sort of better than his contemporaries. Yeah. That's a relevant comparison. What do you think about that? I don't know. I I, I would, after just reading the, the uh, excerpt here from, or reading the uh, his presidential address, uh, that'd be a little t tough for me to make that. <laughs> 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 to, be that to be that forgiving for a person to be in such a, a position to make such statements. I mean, he may have been caught up in the, uh, uh, you know, the progressiveness of, of the time of the progressive era. Maybe he saw himself speaking for the profession as a whole. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> well, uh, I, mean, I, think, I think this one is, is, is right in the sense that American economics was sure. you know, backwater relative to, uh, you know, really American economists, as a, on average, were major kind of, uh, U.S. didn't really become the center of economic law until World War II or after. Right. In the early 20th century, Vienna and Cambridge and you know, Stockholm, I guess, were the places where those were the real centers of and America was a bunch of times. <laughs> if um if Davenport called Marshall and others utopians and pie in the sky sort of people, what was his approach to uh to economics? Was he a more of that Lenny and Darwinist? Well he definitely studied with that one. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, throw me the Darwinist. I'm not sure about that. He definitely studied with Veblen. He didn't want to study the institutions, although it comes out. It's very. It's very odd. I mean, it is. It's actually reading. You know, one person says he's with Marshall, and Schumpeter says he's with the Austrians, and and he says he's with neither. Uh, you have to kind of just read it and and decide. It's like the uh, the American address here. Um, he'll walk with the socialists. We'll both get to the same end or different ends, but we'll walk together or whatever. What were the tools that he used? Strictly verbal analysis. I mean, no, no Marshallian uh, you know, supply and demand, from what I can tell, uh, using the marginal opportunity cost idea. I mean, he used that, which was definitely Austrian. Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer your your question any fuller than that. Yeah, I was struck um, in some of the quotations that you were reading. It seems that, if I remember right from the, um, this article by McNulty on the origin, on the, the changing use of the word competition in economics, it was right about this time mm -hmm. when Davenport was writing when the term competition began to be used by, by economists in a way different from the common sense notion of rivalry or struggle, mm -hmm. which is the way modern Austrians interpret competition. Uh, but rather towards the, the the modern neoclassical version of you know describing a set of conditions, mm -hmm. large numbers of anonymous buyers and sellers, and so on. Um, and it seems like Davenport has that notion of competition in mind. Of the rivalrous, or of no, the he has the latter. He has the static notion with your quotations about um, uh, concerns about uh, you know, large accumulations of wealth as sort of deviations from competition. Well, yeah, and the predation and whatnot. I may have read those out of context from. Uh, I, I would say that, that once once again just comes from you know, Veblen. I guess Veblen just despised capitalism and and the accumulation of wealth. 
What's your sense but, of but, Davenport's view? But I, was, I, I would probably shoot that over and, and say it kind of picks up on what uh, Paul was saying. That's the utopia. That's the that's the bad mouth and these utopian thinkers of perfect information and, and this competitive system. So in that respect, and maybe he did uh, have the rival rivalry uh, idea there. I'm not. Does that answer? I mean, it could be. I think that might be the utopian that uh, that Paul was talking about. These utopian thinkers, because that's—I mean—we we talk about that. This utopia of you know zero transaction cost world, perfect competition, everybody knows everything. You know, let's get on with the day. Uh, that kind of utopia. That I think he was actually bad mouthing that. What, I was going to say it seemed to me in some of those quotes when he's talking about it's correct if I'm wrong, but they're speaking of. Uh, the need for inheritance taxes and progressive taxation to save capital and other kind of, is that, is that? Yeah, my impression was that Davenport claimed that in order for the system to be competitive, certain controls had to be in mm -hmm. place to make sure that. Yeah, but I don't think it was the rivalrous. I, uh, right, but, that, but, my, but my point is that if that is what he meant, then that gives us a clue as to when the word competition sure. came to yeah, be used in a... In, right. in the modern way, as opposed to the way the common sense way. It's, un it's unclear though why he thought that, that this in inequality of income was going to hurt right. the competitive system. Mm -hmm. It could be a, almost like a Schumpeterian in the sense capitalism is trying to sell, and that, mm -hmm. you know, if we get this, yeah. you know, the, the haves, the have-nots going to go crazy. And is that kind of he refuses but, to offer any opinion of, about whether what is this, this pornography and funny hats and. Right. This, Patent of medicine or whatever, he thinks that they all constitute wealth uh, if people regard them as sure. wealth, right? So he doesn't have anything to say about them. But somehow, if you get too many funny hats and too much pornography, yeah. then, <coughs> then you have to take it take it away, right? Under his view of the accumulation yeah. of wealth. Yeah. I, I think it was. I think a lot of his theory, uh, just in reading, I read part of the value and distribution part of the economics of enterprise, um, and just in reading like Vetter's review of economics and enterprise and now we can and, and just people put him in putting him in different uh, pigeonholes than he would put himself I think his writing was just somewhat confused or confusing at least to read uh, to, to interpret what he actually did mean uh, oh. trying to get rid of the psychological factors but yet sneaking them in to explain things well one of the things that I think helps clear up some of this you know, uncertainty as to what he's saying because he's wanting to eliminate the psychological. Uh, although he's subjective on cost and apparently he's, you know, he's not um, uh, proselytizing about the way people choose or what types of goods they choose, or, you know, based on that other quote. But uh, it seems to me I remember that he wanted to equate value with price. Exactly. Instead of, you right. know, instead of creating a different category of. Uh, for subjective value and another category for exchange value or price, um, he wanted to equate value. In the it, it was directly with price, and so I think he understands subjective value of goods and the, uh, the subjective notion of cost. But when it comes down to it, um, he's, he wants to keep that link. Yeah, um, in there for some reason. I can't remember. Uh, I don't have it in my notes here. He he spoke a good deal about uh, the price and the market price being. It, it was a price. You can't say this very well without uh, that being meaningless. When we talk about price theory. We can easily talk about micro price theory or whatever. Uh, and his was strictly what you were talking about, looking strictly at the price as given by the market mm -hmm. um, and, and gaining value from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What do you mean exactly gaining value from the price given? That, that you, once again, it's not the marginal utility right. that you cause value to a good. It's the good causes you utility or disutility. Based upon so you, price? Yeah, based upon price. Yeah. I mean, it comes back, it comes from the market to you. The price is somewhat exogenous. You sort of mm -hmm. take them from the market and, and interpret their value based on that. Yeah. I think so. That, uh, the 
this, the only thing that's measurable is market price. All these ruminations about what's behind right. market price are, you know, they're there all right, but who cares about them? Um, let's get on with the deal and take demand curves from, take market, start, right. start with market sure. demand curves and work from there and stop, you know, messing around with the basis of them. But does it give any indication why the demand curve slopes down to the right, though? Well, oh, for the same reason as Marshall would, uh, I believe. It's, it, we have. Uh, well, well, Marshall starts with the in, individual yeah. stuff right. and then discards it pretty soon, but I mean, he builds up. Yeah, I'm not. From what I'm saying, I don't know. I can't. I can't answer that intelligently. He uh, he talks about uh, it not being the the marginal utility curve of Jevons, mm -hmm. uh, so. Would he have any idea, Keith, if he would have, um, if it is down with something, if he would have seen it more of a discrete I have rather no idea. than just a, no a idea. smooth curve? Was there much originality in Davenport? It seems like he's just taking other ideas and recombining them. So did he have any of that? I think, I think Schumpeter, uh, in a footnote, comments that there, there's something there, and I, I believe it was is one of these gentlemen, uh, either Buchanan or Haney or one of these guys said that of the value and distribution that it was tedious, but you know, there was, there was grains there, there were grains of originality. And I think Schumpeter basically says the same thing, but then he doesn't, you know, devote any pages in his history of economic analysis to his thoughts. So, um, maybe, you know, a long way to go for, for a little, well, what about the idea of the entrepreneur? That, that was not a uh, prominent notion in any kind. When Schumpeter came out with this book, what, in 1913 yeah. or something? He was in Germany, and yeah. he came up to toss out the idea of the entrepreneur. It was, that's, it was I think that's what Schumpeter, regard. in the footnote, if, it, if I am remembering this one correctly, I think that is where he says that the, the value is to be, to be, to be looked at in, in the value and distribution uh, book. Um, and that he, he says it would, you know, has been sorely misstudied or understudied, not misstudied, understudied. So there could be, yeah. Um, along those lines, what Jeff's saying, I think it's, uh, I've gotten the impression from what I've been exposed to Davenport in classes and such. Like that. It was almost like a marginal utility theory, and that is a bunch of independent thinkers coming up with a similar idea at roughly the same time. And I think that may be where the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, among American economists, he was one of the first to sort of develop that notion. Uh, there may have been other economists mm -hmm. that have developed it better, but the notion was uh, being done independently and uniquely sort of by a bunch of different scholars about at the same time. Get back to Jeff's point uh, about uh, about Davenport putting him sort of in a relative perspective. And I wasn't actually aware that he had, was president of the American Economic Association in 1920, but... Um, to achieve that type of honor, you had you had to be um, kind of wacky in some in some respect to uh, to get that to, to be able to to be appointed president of the American Economic Economic Association. It's <laughs> 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 like today. Yeah. Yes, I mean it, 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 has, it hasn't changed much, and actually, I think it's in many respects it's probably improved uh, to 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 some degree. Um, you have to remember, as Jeff suggests, the, the current state of the profession, most of the trained e economists were trained in Germany, in the German Historical School, or by their students here in the United States. And, uh, of course, his, um, his major professor was, was Veblen. Um, and, uh, and, and many of the prominent economists in terms of the founding of the American Economic Association were... Um, Basically, what we wouldn't even consider economists nowadays: uh, Veblen and, and uh, yeah. uh, Ely yeah. and, 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 and uh, Simon Patton and, and some of these people um, uh, who just had uh, outrageous ideas. And the idea that they might appoint a free market Austrian economist just you know <laughs> not, just doesn't uh, compute at all. I mean, they just uh, that would, they would have never considered. Uh, Somebody along those lines, somebody along, you know, some sort of pure Austrian lines. I don't think. Uh, and so, uh, 
and, and like I said, I think in, in some respects the American Econo Economic Association Im improved after the rise of Columbia and Chicago and, and New York um, in this century. But before that, it was uh, things were things were pretty bad in the profession. And the only thing I've ever seen by uh, that I've ever read by Davenport is his uh, value and distribution, and it uh, it's, it's See, it's pretty good stuff, except for some of these things about value equals price. And if you keep that in mind, it's it's pretty good, uh, pretty good material. We've been working on the uh, at the workshop on the concept of interest and the concept of capital. Very rough going. <laughs> Got to watch out for that workshop. But I mean, Davenport, <laughs> Davenport, um, yeah, Davenport. Um, from what I can remember, you know, really seemed to have a really good idea. Of uh, about what the Austrians were up to and, and the other theorists, the, the Clark, uh, Bombavark uh, debates, all that kind of stuff is in there, and it's uh, he, he's got a good handle on it. Uh, I remember with respect to Wieser and Bombavark in particular, their views, um, he understood them as well as, as we do nowadays, and uh, he, he kind of uh, attacked... Uh, these are, I think, for the collectivist, the more sort of mm -hmm. collectivist uh, approach to things, and and, uh, and liked uh, Bombavric uh, more so. Of course, on the other hand, I, I remember those sites to uh, Menger too. So uh, difficult to tell. Hey, I would hate to uh, have the story end without getting Leland Neger's position on that report. Do you have an opinion? <coughs> I'm, I'm not well read in Davenport, but I have <coughs> read his uh, sections on macroeconomics, which I think he was quite sound, pretty much ahead of his time. His interpretation of depressions was what we would call today monetarist or New Keynesian, which is quite different from Keynesian. I'm sound on the right track. If you can barely read Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess we'll thank uh, Keith very much for a very tough one. Appreciate it.